By the way, I must, I must really make this very clear right from the very beginning. Um, I was deeply concerned last week when uh, Chuck made the announcement that it sometimes took four years to find a pastor. <laughs> so I have, I've chosen to speak on Job, 42 chapters, verse by verse. That ought to carry us through. But just in case it doesn't make it, there, you may think the only thing I can preach on is books by the, that begin with J. Joshua, John, but remember, there's still Jeremiah, Joel, Jonah, Jude, and James. We'll make it through the four years. <laughs> Not somehow, but triumphantly. <laughs> Goodness. I, I don't. I, I have no idea what might be passing through your mind when you heard me say Job. Some are saying Job. Uh, yeah, Job. Not Job. Job. It's spelled J O B, but it's Job. And nobody has any idea what the word, what the name really means. It, it doesn't mean something mystic. In fact. The prologue, which is the first part of the book of Job, introduces to us to all the characters that are going to ha be there except one. And there's no mystic significance to any of the names. Uh, nobody, nobody knows what, except that they're there because they're historic characters. That's what, a, a, a main fact when we look at the book. Job is not legend. It may now have become legendary, but Job wasn't a legend. He was a man. That's what the book said. You read it. There was a man in Uz. Uz. <laughs> you have any idea where Uz is? Uz is? Good night. No, nobody knows that either. They don't know that. It's not a, it's not a place we can easily identify uh, in latitude, longitude there, uh, but it's a place. Uh, you know, if some fake, if some, if some uh, would-be writer had tried to invent this book, he would have chosen some place that had some oomph and, and some special meaning. He would, uh, he, he would have selected something that was that was that had a, had a place in geography, and a place that you would easily recognize in history, so he could hang the tail on those points. No, but there was a man. Now the book is old. The, the book, the book is the man, the man Job, older. He probably came from the patriarchal times. There was a man who lived in the times of. Of, of Abraham and, and, and those men. But he didn't live in Palestine, the Holy Land. He lived probably north and east, or maybe, maybe, in, some people say maybe south around the Dead Sea, but he did not live in the Holy Land. He did live in a place where he could farm. Kansans would have loved it. He had all kinds of farm animals. I'm not going to talk about that today. But he was a man. And that's the principal thing. Some people say, well, now I know all about Job. Uh, it deals with um, the problem of suffering. Uh, why do the righteous suffer? Well, if it does, nobody answers the question. You go through an epilogue, two chapters. You go through all those chapters of poetry. And you meet God in the last chapter... And still nobody says, this is why. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit more a little later. But that it more probably talks about and comes to grips with, how does a godly man suffer? And it will come to grips with that. The prologue is in prose. The epilogue is in prose. So there are two chapters written like a narrative at the beginning. And there is a chapter at the end, virtually the entire chapter, written in, in prose. In between, 
There's a poetical section. And that's why the book, Job, belongs in the poetical books of the Old Testament. And, and some people have described this, this, uh, this book in, 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 in terms like this. It's lyric. Well, lyric comes from the lyre, meaning it's musical and, and it flows like that. And there is a kind of lyric note. But that's not a really good final description. And they say, well, it's a dramatic book. Uh, if by dramatic you mean it has some pizzazz, yeah. But if you mean dialogue in the development of a dramatic port- uh, portrayal on a stage, doesn't have much of that. It's not conversational dialogue in any event. Um, uh, others say that, that the book has, has a... Uh, um, epic flavor to it. Now, an epic is something that traces the, the story of a hero. Well, you, there is a hero here. That's true. But it, uh, an epic usually has something a little more military about it or militant about it. And epics come like Dante's Inferno and uh, uh, the Iliad and the Odyssey and, and Paradise Lost and things of that nature. Not so much epic. You know what this is? This is a message from God. And it's in His arrangement. And it's couched in very Old Testament times. This is true. But it's a book for every age. The only problem is that it has been described as classic. Mark Twain says, said, he's not saying it anymore. He said... A classic is something everybody expects you to read and nobody reads. That's probably true. Classics are the books on the shelf that you have to take out and go, you know, because they've gathered dust. But uh, it's unfortunate that it gets that. Because Job, because it's called classic, doesn't have many enthusiastic readers. I hope we convert some in this process here. Now, at the risk of offending everybody in the congregation, I'm going to put something up here that will provide the outline for the message this morning. Now, you may have put that down and keep it for posterity. Um, uh, I did not major in hieroglyphics. Um, I, I, um, I didn't major in art, I'll tell you that. Uh, but that's it. Now, don't go home yet. I'm going to fill it in. But, but that's, that's the message. You read it. It's the first verse in Job. Uh, you know I'm reading from King James, but it's very similar to what you have. There was a man... In the land of us. And I've already commented on the fact this is not going to be dealing with a phantom. It's not going to be dealing with, a, with an imagination. This is not sanctified imagination. This is cold history. Do I know when it happened? No. But there's evidence through the book, as we'll, we'll see as we go along, that it was patriarchal. But there was a man. The book, the Bible, is about God and man. And mostly God. But it's on God's dealing with man. So it's appropriate that he comes to us with this. There was a man in the land of us, unknown place. Not sure where it is. But there was a specific man whose name was Job from a specific place. So we're not dealing with just some once upon a time. There was... No, this is this is cold, cold fact. There was a man. And there follows... Something in this verse that you should never let go of in the reading of the book of Job in any part. Never let go of verse 1. Verse 1 is God's introduction to the character of Job. And in this prologue, he's preparing us with a point of view to look down the road and see every other thing that happens with this in mind. 
This is basic. You can't understand the poetry without understanding the prologue. But you must also bear in mind this. The characters in the prologue didn't know what you know when you read the prologue. They were living this one step at a time. You and I have the advantage of reading the author, the Holy Spirit, through whoever that human author was, about this man. And here it is. The first description of this man is in the version that you read this morning, blameless, perfect, in the older version. This man from us was perfect. The word perfect in Hebrew is that. Round, complete, whole, unbent, untwisted. Um, not sinless doesn't mean that. But it means having reached what he was supposed to have reached. We use this in John, First John. We talked about perfect and being perfected. Reaching the goal. This, this man was complete, whole, not bent out of shape. Actually, these first two descriptions of this man are a description of a man among men. A man living in his ambience. A man living in his world. A man living with the people of his world. A man living with the things of his world. A man living in, 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 the, in, 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 in the middle of the, of the ambience. A man with men, the first two. And how was this man among men? Balanced. Balanced, complete, whole. And the word blameless is a good word to use for this. If he had a fish on the back bumper, he stopped at stop signs. Do you? If he had a cross around his neck, he didn't show up in the bar. Now, what am I saying? I'm saying, here is a man who lived among men, and they couldn't point their finger at him and say, Yeah, but... You're a... Let me read you something from, from the New Testament. Philippians chapter 2. So that you may prove yourselves to be blameless. Actually, 12 through 15 would be a good thing to read, but just 15. And innocent, children of God above reproach, in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. That's what God wants us to be. To live a blameless life. So people can't say, yeah, but you. Consistent. Maybe you ought to add that word to that. What job was that? Complete? Whole? You know what? I want to remember that when the friends come at him and say, you sin and you continually sin and God punishes you because of that. You need to keep this in mind. Man among men, without blame, an overseer in the church, bishop, elder, presbyter, must be above reproach and have a good reputation with those outside the church. First Timothy chapter 3. It's required. Okay, look at the second one. Well, I better tell you, I want to remind you of something. Brindy asked me to do this. Last, no, in September of 07, I preached here in, on Colossians chapter 1, and I don't expect you to remember anything but the illustration. Uh, and I talked about a Ford I had, on which car I put some new tires, which I bought at a bargain price, you may recall. 
And those bargain tires made that car come down the road like this because they were blems. And I didn't know what a blem was. First of all, the guy told me that they had a cosmetic problem. And cosmetology for tires was something new for me. I didn't really understand. I know. But this tire, this, these tires were egg-shaped tires. I mean, it, so they're out. So the car responded in that egg-shaped manner as it came down the road. They weren't round. They weren't perfect. They weren't whole. They weren't complete. They weren't what tires are supposed to be. Well, what, what this word Tom is saying about this man, he was what he was supposed to be. A man among men, upright like that. Well, that's our next word. Perfect. Upright. I think you have the word straight, do you not? Do you have upright? Upright. Straight. He was honest. He lived according to a norm, and the norm showed. It was evident. You're different. You're not bent, and you're not, you're not crooked. You're straight. You live according to a norm. And so, what you have here is, is a man that, that is very straight. He does live, he did live according to a norm. Now... Listen to this from Colossians 4. Conduct yourselves. And by the way, that word in the Greek is walk. Conduct yourselves with wisdom toward outsiders, making the most of the opportunity. Be careful in Ephesians that you walk not as unwise, but as wise. And I like the King James on that. It says, see that you walk circumspectly. I've referred to that before. And the fact that when we lived in Latin America, the walls, the people that it put up to keep others out, on the top had broken glass. They would break bottles and set them on the top of the wall, set them in the, in the concrete, on the top of the wall. And it did deter people from climbing the wall. But every once in a while, you would see a cat walking on the top of that wall, but walking very carefully, very circumspectly, because the cat knew the glass was damaging, and he would walk up, walk circumspectly. That's what the New Testament tells us to be as believers. Okay, this man did that. He was all that he should be, and he walked straight Honest, always consistent. Remember it as we come to the discussion of the friends. Walk circumspectly. All right, how about the next one? One that feared God. Not terror. And he, doesn't use, he doesn't use that word there, and he doesn't use that word terror when he talks about the fear of the Lord in the New Testament. It's a word that means worshipful submission. Um, it, it, you know, uh, I, I don't use the word reverence. We can. The Scriptures use it uh, in, in some of the versions. And I like, but reverence to so many people means nothing more than being quiet in church when the prelude starts. You know, I mean, that's, that's how they feel. That's reverence. They're not quiet inside. They're thinking of a bunch of different things and their mind's going, but no. So reverence has lost something in that sense. But this is, this is worshipful submission. And think of the Proverbs. Full of this kind of thing. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, beginning of wisdom and knowledge. There are two different references in the first chapter and in the ninth chapter. The fear of the Lord, this worshipful submission, is where wisdom begins. And, and, and this worshipful submission brings us a perspective that works like eyeglasses and puts things into focus. Our recognition, these two qualities, this one we're talking about now and the next one, are a man before his God. 
Now, that means, that means this has to be converted, this angle, this aspect of geometry, and this is the geometry of Job. But this angle has to be converted a little bit. So if we're going to go it that way, we, this is, this is the one that fears God, so I'll do this. And have that guy on his knees. It isn't just worship, which might be this, in some people's interpretation of worship. It's submission. I don't know. I do not know what Job knew about God. And I don't know how he found out. If us is what we suppose it is outside of the Holy Land, and there's no reference in the whole book to the law of Moses. There's no reference to any national connection with Abraham. No reference whatsoever. Uh, so here we are in a place where there was almost maybe a, a Melchizedek kind of a thing. A, a, a group of people who knew something about God. And this man knew enough to have worshipful submission to him. His angle is bent. This is the Job of the book. You may have only known of the Job of the problem. Or maybe you only knew of the Job from James, where it talks about his perseverance and his patience, and he did have that, and he was that. But you missed the point. Here's where we're beginning to get the focus on the kind of man it is. We're going to see the problem, but this is where we see, what is that? The fourth one. He turned from evil. He rejected it. I, I want to read to you from another section of the Proverbs. It's Proverbs chapter 4. Do not enter the way, the path of the wicked. Don't proceed in the way of evil men. Turn from it. Pass on. And I read an interesting comment on that. Go by that gate. Walk by that gate. It's easier to avoid the occasion of sin than it is the sin the occasion presents. That may mean giving up your newspaper. That may mean giving up some friends. That may mean staying away from certain places. Walk by them. Don't go near that gate. Why would you expose yourself to that kind of temptation? That's the point. What did he do? This last one. He turned from... And that angle, <laughs> that angle, well, sort of, that angle would be this. He's running. Do you remember what God said in his word to Paul or Timothy? Flee! Don't walk casually by. He doesn't say that. <laughs> Don't walk casually by. He didn't say that. He said, run! He did. He chose. He chose to live an ethic that was pleasing to God. And he didn't know what you know. And he didn't know what we know. He didn't have the book. He didn't have all that revelation. Neither did he know of all the resources that were available. But here was a man in very pristine, maybe primitive times, who knew something and is described with a character that glows. Does he have problems? Oh, man. We're going to see that he did. We're going to see 
We're going to see how God put his stamp on this man. The book actually ends. I'm going to tell you the ending. The book actually ends with saying, You men never said what was right, as my servant Job did. Don't sink into the mire of the dialogue that comes in the poem. And you won't if we understand what's in the prologue. There was a man whose name was Job, and he came from us. And what kind of a man was he? Whole, straight, fearing God and turning from evil. God help us to demonstrate the character of a Christian in the world in which we live. A Christian is a man who knows Jesus Christ, a woman who knows Jesus Christ as personal Savior. But it doesn't end there. It's a person whose life has been changed by Jesus Christ. And the walk shows it. And the talk shows it. Job was that kind of person in an economy way back there. But we can be this kind of people. These kinds of, no, this kind of person. We can be this kind of person because the New Testament gives us all of those rights, all of those privileges, and all of those responsibilities. God help us. Father, I pray that thou would help us as believers to walk in this fashion, as Job did, to be this kind of person. And Father, help those who do not know the Lord Jesus as their personal Savior. You come to realize what tremendous resources there are in Jesus Christ. Life eternal and forgiveness. Father, we're grateful. In Jesus' name.